Hi, I'm Nathan Heckman, and right now I'm going to talk about why trigonometric inverse functions don't and can't exactly undo the original functions, as you'd hope they would, being called inverses. So just a refresher, sine, the sine function, is uh, takes the angle theta in a right triangle, and it gives you the ratio of opposite over hypotenuse. Cosine takes the angle theta in a right triangle, and it gives you the adjacent over hypotenuse. Tangent function takes the angle theta in a right triangle, and it gives you the opposite over the adjacent angle. So the classic sine, cosine, tangent functions turn the angle theta into a specific ratio of sides. Their inverse functions on the surface put information in the opposite direction. So while the sine function took in theta and gave you the ratio opposite over hypotenuse, the inverse sine or arc sine function takes the ratio opposite over hypotenuse and gives you the angle theta. See the brown arrow here, how it points the opposite direction of the green arrow here. Likewise with arc cosine or cosine inverse and arc tangent or tangent inverse, the input and output are swapped. Now, why can't, um, why can't these inverse functions exactly, you know, precisely always invert so that say, um, first you run the sine of an angle and then you, uh, run the arc sine on that output, why won't it always give you exactly what you started with? Well, the thing to realize is, looking at a sine wave, when you run the sine function, there's what you might call a loss of information. Because if you run the sine function and you get, let's say, negative one half right about, right about there, the uh, output of, you, you input an angle and it outputs negative one half as the ratio of opposite over hypotenuse. Well, you could get the same thing here and here and here. There are two places in every 360 degrees or every two pi radians, as you want to define it, where the sine function will output, will, um, you know, given the angle you input, the output will be negative one half. So when you run the sine function, if I just give you the output, and the output's negative one half, you don't know what the input was. It could have been any of these points where it was negative one half. So that's some that loss of information, that loss of what was exactly the original angle. We just know the output is negative one half. Um, that's you might think of it as a problem when we create our inverse functions. So if you recall, creating an inverse function with a graph, you reflect over the line y equals x. So the sine function made into arc sine looks kind of like this vertical snake versus this horizontal snake. However, in order to remain a function, it must pass the vertical line test, and uh, which means the part that we took out of the original sine function to make into arc sine, it must pass a horizontal line test so that the um, arc sine function passes the vertical line test. But, um, And one way to think about that, about why the original function must pass the horizontal line test, and why that's kind of sort of the best we can do, is because passing the horizontal line test, all those repeats, you know, all those y equals negative one halves, we just have exactly one of them. And every y value here, we have exactly one y value. Um, in other words, that loss of information we talked about, where after running the sine function, if I just give you the output of the sine function, you can't know exactly what the input was because all these, you know, all these uh, angles that give an output of negative one half, y equals negative one half in the sine function, you know, just given the output of the function sine, you can't tell which of those was the input. So um, that loss of information is sort of built into the structure of these uh, arc functions because uh, we choose a part of this function where you have exactly one input for every output, you know, exactly one output for every input. We reflect it like we said, whenever you invert a graph, you reflect it over y equals x, 
So here we invert this portion, which was chosen so that it passes the, the um, horizontal line test. Likewise, here with cosine, we choose this portion. In the case of sine, it was between negative one-half pi and, um, and po positive one-half pi. In the case of cosine, it's between zero and pi. In the case of tangent, it's between negative one-half pi and positive one-half pi. Part of the reason for this, if you're familiar, is that um, sine and tangent are odd functions. In other words, if you reflect them over the x-axis and then the y-axis, you'll get the same thing, whereas cosine is an even function. I could go into more depth on that, but I don't think that's very directly relevant. Anyway, so looking at looking at the original functions, we chose a part of each that passes the um, horizontal line test. And as they're functions already, they all pass the vertical line test. So when we invert them, again, these um, blue sections are the inverses of sine, cosine, and tangent, respectively. And because we chose a part of the original function that passed both the horizontal and vertical line test, when we invert it, it still does pass both the horizontal and vertical line test. And again, there was that loss of information when you ran sine. Um, I just want to show you kind of what that looks like. So here we go. Let's choose an easy angle for sine. Let's say sine of mm -hmm, sine of thirty degrees. Um, if you if you recall, that should be one half. Sine of thirty is one half. Well, there's another angle. Um, there's another angle whose sine is one half. And that is sine of 180 minus 30 degrees. In other words, 150 degrees. That is also positive one half. Sine of 30 and sine of 150 degrees are both positive one half. Okay, so what happens? if you take the arc sine of one half. In other words, if you use what we call the inverse function of sine, you take the arc sine of a one half. Well, looking at, um, looking at the inverse function of sine again, you see that uh, the range only goes up to, um, in the positive direction, the range only goes up to positive 90 degrees, in other words, pi over 2. So we're not going to be able to get back that 150 degrees that we put in in the second example. It's only going to return that 30 degrees. So if we do arc sine of sine on 30 or arc sine of sine 150, in both cases, we're going to, we're going to get the same thing, which is we're going to get 30 degrees back. And that's just in order to maintain the, uh, you know, the functionality and also because of that loss of information, that if you take the sine of multiple things, and I just tell you the output of the sine, you can't know what the input was because there's that repetition um, once per cycle for, you know, the peaks, the absolute peak and value of the functions, but, but twice per cycle for everything else. There are those, um, you know, the, the function sine itself, if taken as a whole, does not pass the horizontal line test, so you can't invert the whole thing. You have to choose a part of it. And the same thing with cosine and tangent. And that's why these functions don't exactly undo each other. Thanks very much.